Modern warfare is all about mobility. The day of the trench war is gone. Today's successful campaign depends to a great extent on the flexibility and mobility of the troops and weapon systems involved. Towards the end of the First World War, the battlefield became dominated by the tank. Highly mobile and relatively invulnerable, and in World War II, the tank further consolidated its supremacy. Although air power in the shape of tank-busting fixed-wing aircraft took its toll of the tank, it was a long time before a weapon system that truly matched the tank appeared. Enter the Air Cavalry. Reconnaissance and observation helicopters fulfill the offensive exploration role that used to be the domain of the cavalry. But the Sikorsky S-76, the B-0105 or the Lynx can also double as airborne artillery for close support or anti-tank operations. The firepower of the modern combat helicopter is awesome. One single Apache can hit home with a power and precision that would have been unimaginable in the First World War. Advanced avionics give the dedicated attack helicopter all-weather combat capability. Forward-looking infrared or night vision goggles allow them to be as capable in low visibility conditions as in bright daylight. Night vision systems give the crew the chance to hit the enemy when he least expects it at night. The first attack helicopters specifically designed for the job made their debut in Vietnam and they clinched their place in the modern warfare team during the Gulf War. In Operation Desert Shield, that was the massive logistic move that preceded Desert Storm, some combat helicopters self-deployed, that's to say they made the long ferry flight to the Gulf under their own steam. But most were transported there in cargo planes like the huge Galaxy or by ship.
the big Super Stallion helicopter was just one type used during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. There were Pumas and the little Kiowa, the military version of the Jet Ranger. But the major roles were played by the Black Hawk and the Apache. was the ultimate proof of the importance of specialized air warfare missions. It wasn't just the fighters and attack aircraft that proved their worth, but also the heavy transporters, the aircraft for electronic warfare, for early warning and air refueling. Vietnam was often called the Chopper War, but Desert Storm might just as well claim the title. In the Gulf, helicopters were used pretty much like jeeps were used in the Second World War. General Schwarzkopf, one of the strategic masterminds of the Gulf campaign, used a Black Hawk to monitor operations, just like Patton had done 50 years previously with his Willis. The desert environment put a severe strain on everything and everyone, but particularly on the helicopters. To stop sand getting into the engines and eroding the turbines, they had to fit specially developed particle separators and filters in the intakes. Despite the harsh conditions, the Black Hawks were used intensively and they were not found wanting. Their load carrying capability, as well as their speed and flexibility, proved great assets. Hawks carried heavy equipment like vehicles and field howitzers on a sling, enhancing the mobility and striking capability of the ground troops. Black Hawk, like most military helicopters, can deliver suppressive fire, but by definition it's not as good at the close air support role as dedicated attack aircraft like the Apache. The AH-64 was one of the great coalition stars during the Gulf War. It's built by McDonnell Douglas in the great tradition of its famous Vietnam ancestor, the AH-1 Cobra. As a two-person crew, it's agile and fast, and it carries an advanced weapon system with awesome striking power.
Apache was designed for close air support, anti-tank warfare and escorting other helicopters, so it's built to survive in the hostile environment of the battlefield. It's a hard target to knock out of the sky. The crew and important systems are armour protected, which means they're more or less impervious to small arms fire. The gearbox can keep going for hours without oil. The main rotor shrugs off a direct hit from a 23mm shell. And even if Apache does get shot down, the crew has a 95% chance of surviving a crash at up to 2,500 feet per minute rate of descent on impact. Apache carries a wide spectrum of weapons, all controlled by a sophisticated management system and aimed by the movement of either crew person's helmet-mounted sight. So, if they're looking at you, you're in trouble. The four pylons under the stub wings carry rockets and missiles. One regular combination is eight laser-guided Hellfire missiles and 38 Hydra high-speed 70mm rockets. That's a 30mm chain-driven gun in the turret under the nose, also aimed by the crew's helmet sights. high-tech Hellfire missile was much used in the Gulf War. This is actual war footage. And this is what Hellfire does to armoured vehicles. US forces were the only ones to use dedicated attack helicopters. The other coalition allies had multi-purpose combat helicopters. The British Army, for instance, used the fast, agile and versatile Westland Lynx. The distinctive sand filters on the air intakes mark it out as an aircraft specially modified for the dusty desert conditions. The French Aviation Légère de l'Armée de Terre, ALAT, operated the Aerospatiale Gazelle, along with the forces of the UK, Qatar and Kuwait. It's a bit older than Lynx. But when it was designed in the mid-60s, it did have some novel features that have allowed it to stay near the forefront for light helicopters even today. war finally proved the case, if proof were needed, for the dedicated attack helicopter. Several European nations, France, UK, Germany, the Netherlands for instance, all decided they needed some. One competitor for Apache is the Tiger, built by the Franco-German consortium Eurocopter, although the UK and the Netherlands have settled on Apache itself.
tiger is smaller and lighter than Apache, and it doesn't look quite as fearsome. But appearance isn't everything. For all its success, the Apache airframe is 1970s technology. This is a new generation design with much use of light but very strong composite materials. The result is claimed to be a helicopter as rugged and tolerant to damage as the Apache. The avionics bring together the latest developments in electronics and optronic devices in a mix that maximizes the battle effectiveness. Tiger originated from the B0115, which the Germans had tried to integrate with the Italian A129 Mongoose program. But the German Bundeswehr had greater operational requirements than the Italian army, so the Germans ended up teaming up with the French. Tiger is still in development. At the time of recording, only four prototypes had been built, each characterizing a particular configuration. It's expected that all the different versions will merge into a single multi-purpose attack version. Tiger's flying characteristics are not far off those of a fixed-wing close-air support aircraft. It may not be quite as fast, but it can do manoeuvres that you wouldn't think a helicopter could manage. This is the so-called Gerfo fire support version of the Tiger with the gun turret under the nose. Early on it was given that name Gerfo or Ger Falcon, but that's now been dropped and all the versions go by the name of Tiger. Unofficially the Germans call it Uhu, Owl, from the original UHU designation. Although you might not think so to look at it, the South African CHS-2 Ruivalk is based on the French Puma helicopter. The Atlas division of the Denel Group is responsible for this attack helicopter. It's perhaps not as sophisticated as the Tiger or the Apache, and its weapon systems are still at an early stage of development, but it certainly flies as well. It's extremely rugged and it can operate under the most basic conditions. Those are the characteristics that will probably make it a useful specialist for anti-guerrilla warfare. Also, it won't cost as much as Tiger or Apache, so the manufacturers hope that it'll prove to be an attractive option for third world countries that want to replace their aging Russian gunships like the Mil Mi-24.
The Italian Augusta A129 Mangusta, the Mongoose, has been in service with the Italian Army since the end of 1990. It's interesting, isn't it, that here's the fourth attack helicopter we've looked at, and they all look the same. In fact, they all look pretty much like their common ancestor, the old Huey Cobra. It's partly because the role is deemed to need a two-person crew, and this shape is the best way of accommodating them. The stepped-up cockpit layout affords the best all-round view to both crew members, while at the same time the narrow fuselage offers a more difficult head-on target. The stub wings are not really there to provide lift, although they do provide enough lift to reduce fuel consumption in the crews, but their main purpose is as hard points for hanging weapons on. But the whole point of an attack helicopter lies in its weapons. So even an unarmoured and relatively vulnerable helicopter like the small B0105 can be a fearsome tank buster with its wire-guided hot missiles. The phrase wire-guided, as in wire-guided hot missile, means just what it says. The missile pulls out a lightweight wire and stays connected by this wire to the firing helicopter. The weapon aimer controls the missile onto the target with a joystick whose commands are transmitted down the wire. Meanwhile, the helicopter stays out of range of fire from the target area. Well, well. 